Hey everybody, welcome to It's Real with Jordan and Demi. I'm going to turn my computer this way a little bit. There we go. Okay. Uh, Demi is out for the day. She is on assignment that makes her sound like she's an international journalist. She's a model. She's out modeling. So just me today. Um, and on top of that, we normally a music podcast, but today we have a comedian on, uh, only the second or third comedian we've had on the show. Uh, she's, uh, you, you know, her. she's appeared in, uh, shows like crashing and inside Amy Schumer. You may also recognize her from her stand-up specials on Netflix and comedy central. You can currently see her in the FX original documentary hysterical. Here she is, Rachel Feinstein. Hey, what's going on? How's it going? I'm fresh from a modeling shoot too, as you, you can do see. your makeup and hair is perfect. I'm generally fresh from modeling. Was it was it Chanel or Louis Vuitton this time? It I know was Lou. Of... I call him Lou because we're close. And um, mm -hmm. I was just kind of laying in some foul debris in my own room with some Jaeger on my forehead. And Lou and I were doing mm -hmm. some really fun shots. I have a Couture Run DMC shirt on. I don't know if you can tell, but it's high end. It was probably $120. I saw the same one on the real reel for 90 And I was like, no, <laughs> no. Poshmark. Very. See, I come from money. Poshmark. You do. I know. I know how wealthy you are. Yes. Um, obscenely, obscenely wealthy. Yeah. Uh, so when I was setting this up, Rachel, I was thinking, what have I not talked to Rachel about in real life? And I realized we haven't really talked that much about stand up comedy. Yes. Which is like your bread and butter. And I'm curious. Uh, first of all, let's play a clip from an HBO special that you were on over the summer during quarantine, and we'll talk to you about it on the other side. Okay. We had a hard time in quarantine, and he's a he's a good man, and but like we would argue a lot because like I don't like activities, you know. I just like to sort of lay in a dim room and snack. He likes to do activities. On night two of quarantine, he was like. We should do like a puzzle night where we both start a puzzle at the same time and see who could finish first. I'm like, I would rather have a hysterectomy than do a puzzle off. That's from an HBO special you did. Uh, it was a, a, a stand-up special of the summer that Colin Quinn hosted. Um, you were performing stand-up for a sea of cars, like a drive-in stand-up show. Yes. And as I was watching this this special, I was curious about the logistics of it. What was it like to perform for a sea of cars, like a drive-in movie theater? It's really ideal. It's what we want to do. We want to perform for honks as opposed mm -hmm. to laughs. Um, no, there's the sadness to it. I mean, but we did the best we could. I mean, that's kind of what Colin's special was about. Like he, he was, there was a lot of backstage, like, you know, uh, footage of just us being general animals, you know, talking trash to each other or whatever, but also like, um, you know, what it was like to get back on again after that long. Cause I have no other skills. Like I always wanted to be one of those noble people that was like about to be a doctor, but I made this lofty decision. You're not a bad cook. You're not a bad cook. Thank you. I did make Jordan some ginger soy salmon. Yeah. It was, <laughs> so. it was moist and it was delicious. <laughs> Thank you. Jordan came over to edit this wine commercial we're doing. And I, I like to make, I like to cook. So it was fun to make you something. But um, I mean, I, I, I'm i a general animal, but I have like five or six dishes that I can pull together with Jaeger on my forehead. But um, during that, but yeah, I mean, but generally I was, you know, fired uh, from every other job and, and, and sometimes very quickly. Like I, I was fired in under four hours uh, from fat shoes and clothes on Broadway. And they were right to fire me. Um, I am a hole in the team, generally. That you didn't, you didn't steal anything. You just... I just stink. Like, I, my job at Fat Shoes and Clothes, which is my first job when I moved here with this guy in his band called Dick Sister when I was 17, I got a job on Broadway at Fat Shoes and Clothes. And I was so proud of myself. I felt like I was like a beastie boy because I worked on Broadway. It just seems so cool to me, you know? Yeah. And everybody in my family was told because it's like Rachel, they found a job somewhere because I was like wild moron, like emergency moron D's and F's. So everybody's really excited that I was employed at at, uh, at just a retail store. But that's like, you know, the, the bar was really low with me. And um, and then I was fired in under four hours because I couldn't get people to like buy stuff. And 
I felt really uncomfortable. And then I couldn't fold. He was like, why don't you just fold this stuff? I remember the guy was like, no, come fold. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to fold and he looked at my fold and it was just real slovenly and circumspect. And I remember he was just really grossed out by my fold. And he brought me over to him and he goes, Meh. he goes, come here. And then he went, that's how he fired me. Just like a smearing. Just like a, a hand, a hand gesture. He was like, yeah. and I was like, what tomorrow? What time should I come back? Like, I was like shaking, terrified. Cause I told everybody about my job and he's like, no, tomorrow. Like he could just tell right away. He needed me out. Um, just, I just had nothing to, to bring to the table. And I was so upset. I was like violently weeping. And then when I got back to my apartment with Dick's sister, he didn't want me there either, by the way. Dick's sister was constantly dumping me and then undumping me. Well, like he, he probably was. found other, He the band gets bigger. He Was it going after groupies and stuff? And Oh, you know, yeah. 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 And then he would go like screw a groupie and then like take me back after. I would beg him to undump me and then he would agree to to undump me and I get to come back. So Don't I came you miss back being 17. <laughs> What'd you say? Don't you miss being 17? I do. It was yeah. really fun. I had a lot of self-esteem and I wasn't quaking with mental illness or anything. No, no, so, not at all. No, no. I was running a tight ship, but I came home and I remember uh, to Dick's sister and there was some flowers there from my aunt because I'd gotten a new job. It, that's how sad it was. And I was like, I had to stare at the aunt flowers and call my aunt to tell her I was terminated. Oh, <laughs> the shame, the shame, the shame of the family. You know, I, I, I have a, I have a, that's my dirty secret. I have a really uh, ugly retail past. Not really ugly, but really? I, I worked at the gap. I worked at Hollister. I worked at, I worked at Blockbuster. And I tell you when I worked at Blockbuster, I worked at Blockbuster during the transition from VHS to DVD. They were like, they were giving, they were like giving away the, the VHS tapes for a dollar a piece, you know, and it was my job to like put them out. There was like these, these like sidewalk sale bins outside of the Blockbuster that I had to like reload with old copies of like Robo Cop 3 and stuff, you know. That is hysterical. Were you? Yeah, and I had the, I had the polo shirt, but except... On certain days, you could wear a neon green T-shirt, so you didn't have to wear the polo shirt, and that was like the bonus days. That yeah. is, that's kind of you know, there are perks. You got some special perks. And five, five free rentals a week. Hey, you're worth it. You're yeah, worth it. I was totally worth it. I was totally worth it. I feel like you would be good because at anything really, because you do a job <laughs> thoroughly. I mean, no, but you didn't get fired from any of these fine. No, I quit things. because I was I was a spoiled suburban kid who didn't, you know, I was one of those kids working these jobs because my parents wanted me to learn responsibility, not because I was trying to like help my single mom pay the rents on our right. one bedroom apartment, you know? So yeah, different, different deal, <laughs> different deal. So you, you said you were a terrible student. Yes. See, I think of you as you're from uh, the DC area from Montgomery County, which is kind of a, um, it's a well-to-do area for the mm -hmm. most part. And I was picturing you at a private school on the honor roll, you know, I don't well, know. We moved, I to, we moved to Bethesda before it was Bethesda. So like my dad, he was a civil rights attorney. So he was an attorney, but he worked for the government. So he was, you know, they don't make much money. And then he was not mom, Johnny Cochran. No, no. And then my mom was a social worker and my mom full time. She still is. She won't quit her job. And then my dad, law, like he worked, uh, he prosecuted a lot of like KKK cases and he did a lot of stuff for the civil rights division. Then he tried to go into private practice because he had three kids in Bethesda and got laid off. And then he was a blues musician full time. And my mom was a social worker. So we were like, we had this house, but we were just kind of, you know, house poor in Bethesda because my dad was, he went by Hurricane Howie and he had a band growing up called the Vomitones. That was the name of my dad's band. The it sounds like a ska band. Were they ska? <laughs> they Please were, they were a ska band. <laughs> they played piano and Zydeco accordion. And there were like a few white Jews from Bethesda, mm -hmm. but they applied to my school saying that there was some sort of special multicultural night. And my dad said they were like representing Ghana or something. Oh, yeah. And uh, meanwhile, they're just like Jews from Bethesda. Um, Howie would certainly be canceled for his nonsense now. And rightly so. Howie is out of line. But anyway, the Vomitones played at my school at Multicultural Night. That sounds they, embarrassing. It was not good. My dad used to howl after he finished a song and they would play Blue Moon and Moon. Um, so it wasn't good. No, no it, was, it was tough. There's a lot of reasons that I'm a comedian. There's been a, a just a cocktail of, of pain. You know, it's not good. Do you remember your first stand up set? 
Yes. Yeah. I, um, I played at this bar, um, on the Upper East Side that since burned down and, um, that's half of New York. <laughs> that, I know, right. Everything's burned down. Uh, I'm living in a house that burned down in the eighties. They <laughs> rebuilt it. Yeah. Which is funny. Cause I was, I was fantasizing about a fire. That's how nervous I was. I often fantasize. About half of your life is fire crap though. I know, which is funny. Cause I'm married to a fireman now, but then I wasn't. Who but describes I, horrific fires to you? Oh no, your audio went out. Wait, shit. Oh, there we go. Okay. Rachel, Rachel muted herself for a second. Okay. Am I back? You're okay. back. You're back. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah. So I basically, um, was a, I was very terrified and I was fantasizing that the place would burn down. So I didn't have to go on. I'm sure there's a lot of other ways that I could have not gone on the show, but for some reason I went straight to, it had to be a fire. I mean, nobody needed me on the show. There was a, certainly a supply and demand issue because I hadn't performed yet and I stunk it up. I got on, I had four Jack and Cokes before I went on. That's how nervous I was. And I don't, I'm like a lightweight. Like I usually drink like Malibu pineapples, like one dumb twat drink like that, one Malpine and I'm loaded. So four Jack and Cokes, I was like violently drunk. And then I went on and just sort of rambled incoherently. And I remember feeling like I felt amazing. Like I was like, this is incredible. Did like, you get laughs? No, but I did. I think I was too high off the fact that I was up there that I didn't realize I was like wildly bombing and it was kind of an emergency, but I thought it was incredible. I was like flying, you know, I was so happy. And the microphone, it turns out was kind of in front of my face. It wasn't, nobody could hear me. It wasn't even like directed towards my mouth. It was just sort of diagonally in front of my face. And I was just rambling aimlessly. And they were like waving me off. Like I went way over my time. They brought was, like an old fashioned cane hook thing and like pulled you off. That's so funny that you say a cane hook because I've had bad dreams. I've had that exact nightmare where I'm bombing so badly, like at my high school or some really vulnerable, humiliating place to bomb that I need to be craned off. I've repeatedly nightmared about being craned out of a situation. Like the only way to get me out of there was, was craning. So it's funny you bring that up, Jordan. Yeah, I, uh, I did stand up twice. I just sent for a high school a high school talent show and I won. Really? But I here's the thing is I didn't do like jokes. I didn't do I did like absurdist like stories. Like I told a story about the cheese in my refrigerator deciding to rebel against me because it didn't want to be eaten and it like takes me hostage like Gulliver's Travel style. Hmm. That was like my comedy thing and I wore I had seen like Andrew Dice Clay or something, and I wore like a orange polo shirt with a black leather jacket over the top of it, <laughs> uh, which is really cool. Actually, you got a lot of ass like, in that. I heard you were just swimming in ass. That's I was, I was, you so, know, I still am. I yes. still am. Yeah, teeming with puss. Te right, puss. right. You, your words. They wanted, me on, they wanted me on season twenty-four, of The Bachelor, and. <laughs> I was just like, no, I want, to keep my, like I want to keep my life like private. Stephen Wright of your time. Like that's a very smart, weird. I mean, at least you were trying to do something original. Like it you yeah. definitely seemed like you were like, yeah, like a Bill Hicks. Well, I was like, at the time I was really into Monty Python. So like anything that was like really bizarre or absurd and like yeah. Aqua Teen Hunger for, for style adult swim kind of stuff, you know? So yeah. Maybe I should have gone into alternative comedy. That's the question. How do you feel about the term alternative comedy? Uh, I'm, I mean, I don't really understand it fully. I'm not like, it doesn't like, I'm not opposed to it, I guess. But like, I mean, now it's like everything's alternative. You know, like mainstream is alternative. Like people, you know, speaking of like rich kids, rich kids are wearing like, you know, ironically dirty outfits and dress like they're homelish. At, and there's like totally a trend of people wearing intentionally ugly glasses. Right. Like, so I feel like there's no more real alternative. And in terms of stand up, I feel like everybody's broken every like imaginary rule. So it's like, mm -hmm. just, you know, be funny. You don't need to try to be outside a box. I'm not sure there's a box anymore. I mean, people get canceled. Sure. For anything. And that's a separate problem. You know, the whole thing about you can't say kind of anything anymore, but like, I don't think that, um, but, it, but I feel like everybody said everything already. So, you know what I mean? It's like both, both things. I know. Well, it's, it's funny to say we had, um, we had the singer K Flay on our show a couple weeks ago and we were talking about how music in the music industry 
it's really a lot harder to shock parents with music anymore. Like mm -hmm. when you were a kid and when I was a kid, there was things like, you know, gangster rap and heavy metal and Marilyn Manson and things yeah. like that. And our parents' generation, it was Alice Cooper. And before that it was Elvis. There's really no like way to shock parents with music anymore. And I feel that's kind of the, the same thing that you're talking about with, with comedy. Yes. Yeah. There's no real way to shock. And yet, like, you're not supposed to say a lot of stuff now, but I don't think anything really shocks. I think that's a separate machine. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. I just try to like tell stories about my life and not, and not really try to surprise or shock. I feel like you just have to start with what you think is funny and not have any purpose behind it, whether political or, you know, I don't want to go there. There was some comedian I used to open for and he would, he would be like, when I used to host, you know, um, he'd be like, just go up there and say like, you know, he's, he's not playing by the rules, <laughs> which I thought is a really funny tee up to going up there. So I would kind of prep the audience like, Hey, this guy's going to be taking some risks. A lot of comedians will do these photo shoots where they will be like caution tape over their mouth. And like, they really fancy themselves like a Lenny Bruce about well, to get arrested. Like the kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like they're about to get arrested as soon as they get off stage. Right. Um, yeah, there's like a lot of just like, well, I'm in trouble now, you know? Um, yeah. But I try to just like not think that I'm, I try not to like leather jacket around like that and just go up and share weird, funny stories from your life and not think that you're, you know, pushing the envelope. Yeah. If I thought I was, if, if I look at myself and I'm doing anything where I think I'm like kind of, you know, pushing the, I get disgusted. Even the things I've said in interviews even, where they sometimes somebody will in, will like lead you to say something like I'm out there I'm taking risks and I just get just infuriated that I actually said that because I'm like come on at the end on the, the on the I'm music like, side we get we get a lot of uh, uh, press releases that where the where the singers where they call them badass or tired of something or like you know they're like we're like out here you know that whole like bat you're supposed to be badass now if you're not badass you're not doing it right i feel like yes you know? exactly you got to be out there fucking just uh, like outfit changes be lowered maybe some fire speaking of fire yeah there you has thought to about be, like, a nipple. pyrotechnics on your like, stand-up set what's that you should do some pyrotechnics on your stand-up set like yes some little... i should be lowered in and maybe just a rogue nipple should fall out like a super bowl show or some shit yeah um, for a second to where people have to pause it to make sure that it happens. You know, that's yeah. how you, that's or how you win that kind of situation. You have your, <laughs> wait, was it? And, and it's, it's easier now because back in the VHS days, when you pause the VHS, it would like shake and you couldn't tell if it was like actually there or not. But now yeah. with DVR, you get a clear, you get a clearer shot, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. it's, it's. People know you're you're naughty and you're not there to behave. So they that's right. Get that's hurt. right. You do this. You do this character. I'm just gonna come on thing. handcuffs, like both handcuffs to each other. Like I may as well arrest myself before my shows. So I think you should hands. use Madonna's Bl Blonde Ambition tour from 1990 as the inspiration for your next stand-up special. <laughs> that actually sounds kind of fun. Yeah. Um, I will do that. I will Some do that. edgy, like Truth or Dare style, black and white. Yes, yeah, right. Speaking. I'll just be we or maybe weeping in a in a beige turtleneck, you know, just kind of start. Maybe I'll just kind of cry about my mother and maybe confront her before yeah. I start my show. Yeah, yeah, confront a parent. Just start there, like laying still, weeping, and then just get up with just some dramatic mascara, just kind of falling down my face, and then maybe like a five, four, three, two, one. Yes, <laughs> and giant video boards behind you with like. <laughs> like disturbing imagery of like hurricanes and, you know, like, uh, yes. like people destroying meat with their hands and just the anorexics. Like really... There's gotta be a lot of anorexic underwear, anorexics. Yeah. yeah. And, and a voice that just says the time is now or something like that, you know, like a, like a, a booming <laughs> godlike voice coming over there. I think that, I think I've missed my calling as an art director for standup specials. I know that was yeah. really exciting. But yeah. the time is now, I did get a little chilled when you said that. I was like, oh, the time is now. <laughs> the time is now. The time is now. Um, let's talk about your, your standup um, material. You, you use your family for material a lot, your husband, your parents, the clip we saw was you and your husband during quarantine. I guess I should have introduced it because you say he didn't say you're my husband. Yeah. Uh, but first of all, I want to say about that clip. 
a puzzle off does not sound that bad. Uh, <laughs> I want to know how much did you, was the puzzle off actually suggested? Yes. No, that's all true. He likes to do, my husband likes to do like competitive games a lot. Like even all his like bedside table books are all like getting to the top of the mountain. They're all about like winning and, you know, like getting there for my first. Mine are all like nobody likes a last. loser, Rachel. Nobody likes a loser. <laughs> all my books are like second to last. We'll be fine. I'll see mm -hmm. myself out if I'm bothering anyone. I think he could do like there. There's a niche, uh, the firefighter self help author. That's like something no one has done yet. So Pete could do some books about uh, you know. Yeah, he likes exactly. He likes competing. His family is. I'm a horribly competitive person when it comes to like Scrabble. I beat my sister-in-law in, -law in uh, Scrabble over Christmas and it was like, I'm still talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he is. Like he, one of our first dates, we went bowling and I was just throwing, he was getting all the balls that like, I don't even know what that's called. That's how dumb I am. Like, strike? Strike. He was getting like one strike, strike after strike. I mean, really amazing. And I was just throwing the balls down the gutter. And at one point it was just like kind of humiliating how awful I was doing. We were like a little drunk and I was like, can I take your turn? You know, and you think like. That'd be cute. You like trying to be yeah. cute. Yeah. Right, right. And I did want to take his turn because it was just getting really, I wanted another shot and he was, <laughs> you know, beating me mercilessly. And I, I remember being like, can I do an extra one? And, and he was like, no, the rules are the rules. Like it's not your turn. Like, I'm like, I haven't even put out yet. Like you should want to <laughs> close, but. And who's watching this? Like two people bowling in South Brooklyn. It's like- He thinks he's on ESPN too, you know, yes. all What's of a sudden. That? He thinks he's on ESPN too, you know? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, who cares? Yeah. Who could give a flying fuck? What if he came out in that first date with like the splints on the hand, like the like the big Lebowski style, you know? That would have yes. been, been something. Uh, that would be solid. Yeah, that would be a yeah. solid move on, on his yeah. part, but- but yeah, he likes to do activities. I don't care for activities. Like I said, I just want to sort of lay in a dim room, just do some feeding. That's why it's so freeing to be on the road because I could just lay on my stomach and eat like macaroni and cheese and be like a true pig. And if there's not a fork in the room, I'll use like a coffee filter instead. And nobody's there to, you know, tell me to clean up. He runs a tight ship. He's like anal neat. He makes you use actual silverware and. Yeah. I don't know if anybody's like with anybody like this, but I'd come into the kitchen in the morning and I'm in trouble. I don't really know what for yet, but, he, and he'll, he'll walk me around because he's used to being the boss at the firehouse and he'll walk me around the kitchen and point to like some mess I made the night before and be like, what happened here? I'm like, this is not forensic files. Like no one <laughs> bag that up and send it to a lab. Get off my dick. You like puzzles, figure it out, please. Yeah. Also yeah. stop being 75. Exactly. Yeah. Like he'll be like, why the one morning I woke up and I walked into the kitchen. He goes, why are there three open seltzers? Like he was backed up, upset about the case of three open seltzers. I'm like, isn't the greater mystery who could give a fuck why there are three open seltzers? Because there's not ever going to be a good story that accompanies three open seltzers. It's not like going to be like, I'm like, well, there was blow and hookers. And then the next thing you know, there was three open LaCroix. <laughs> Who cares? That's the next step. Once the blow and the hookers come in, the next step is the open <laughs> seltzer. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, there is, when you do, when you go to Rachel's apartment, they, sh she will offer you seven different types of water. So <laughs> you do have your choices of LaCroix or Pellegrino or um, a filtered water from a uh, a metal drum that and, looks um, like it's from a uh, uh, a survival bunker. I know world. because it is because firemen are all into stuff like this. They don't trust anything, and they're really into privacy. That's why they love Bitcoin. So he has some ludicrous filter that he always wants to talk about when people come over. He's like, "You put red dye in there, and it'll turn out clear." <laughs> and I'm just yeah. like, "Please leave." Yeah. Yeah. Now. You, uh, you use your, your, besides your husband, you use, uh, your, your mother as a character in your, in your standup. How does she feel about being in your standup? She, does she criticize your impersonation of her? Sometimes like, but she also kind of likes it. She'll be like, if I don't talk about her, she'll be like, why didn't she put me in your talent show? That's what she calls my standup, my talent show. Yeah. So she'll be like, why wasn't I in the talent show tonight? And certain things she'll take issue with, like. I said that she wears long menopausal capes and she was like, that was particularly difficult because I was 
going through menopause when I saw that particular skit in your talent show. Ooh, <laughs> ow. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. said she was having hot flashes when At she heard time. me say, describe her outfits as menopausal capes, and it hit a little too close to home for Karen. But the, the, the Chico's aesthetic is like what Karen Feinstein usually a dresses little like in. southwestern capes like she wears a lot of cloaks like kind of navajo looking long cloaks uh a lot turquoise of a hostile, jewelry yes a hostile amount of turquoise jewelry and then she'll act surprised whenever anybody notices one of the pieces she's wearing she goes oh i forgot that i had this on today i'm like that's a navajo graveyard covering your entire left hit yeah it, uh, it sounds like she's like uh you're just like one step away from like appropriation or something Exactly. Yeah. She gets yeah. she gets a little close to that because now she's really upset that her name is Karen because she feels she's been on the front. Line I feel sorry her. for real people named Karen in I real know. life. It's not fair. It's Especially not especially because my mom is like aggressively liberal and would have preferred if I married like a Nigerian lesbian, which I talk about on stage. But so she was appalled, and then she, but see, she was like, she would probably change her name to like Kenya or something, but that would be appropriation. So she's in a tough spot, right? Her, well, um, you know, I'm curious, you don't really talk, a lot of um, Jewish comics talk about their their uh, growing up as, you know, in Judaism, Hebrew school, bar and bat mitzvahs. How much of that did you grow up? How were you, because I think of your parents as these liberal DC um, people, I don't think of them... I know this kind of person. Are were they more secular Jews, or were they? Or are you going to? Yes, my mom weekend? goes to like some congregation, and she loves to tell people she's like, we have a marvelous atheist rabbi who has a beautiful partner named Art. That's way of her way of being very proud that he's gay, but she, she won't say that. She, she'll say she is an atheist rabbi with a partner, Art. My um, mom used to use the term "special friend." They have oh, a special friend. I know. Again, it borders on like. It's, it's tricky territory when you walk yeah. down that lane. Like, it's almost like they need to tell you that the person is is gay, which is kind of problematic in its own. You know, like, it's like, right. can't they just be a person and don't even have to bring it up? But right. my mom's so proud that when Art and his partner moved, she goes, Art and his wonderful partner have moved to Greenwich Village. And they are very funky and fun. And mm -hmm. I think you would love to meet them because you guys have a lot in common. And I think she thinks we have a lot in common because she thinks that they're like funky because they're gay maybe or something, which makes no sense. Um, and also, why does why is there an atheist rabbi? I don't understand what that is. It makes yeah. me so tired. I can't. I just need yeah. a long nap. I can see like in a Unitarian church, I think, you know, because because that's kind of a general like uh a religion revolving around just the beauty of earth and the majesty of life um but yeah that's strange to have uh, a rabbi who she might have said music. agnostic but even that doesn't make sense Why no no you gotta believe in god rabbi? like you're up there you're up yeah. there you gotta believe in god you know it's fine if you don't believe in god but do something else you know exactly you would think maybe you'd pick up elsewhere. open a sporting goods store make, like, or something yeah i think they just have like diversity picnics at their temple or something i don't know what goes on but yeah they were not i didn't grow up in like a typical the dc area liberal is like a different breed of person unto themselves yes. they're very progressive they care about human rights and social justice issues they care about the planet about organic food but they're not the most exciting people in the world they're the people who will be home in bed before midnight when i was um, in that scene in uh, coming out, I was, you know, in my mid twenties and parties would, would be done by 1230 after everyone had had their Bacardi O threes and their, you know, their uh, lining Kugels and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, DC is such a different world than New York. It is. It's, it is. You're right. That's like such a perfect description of DC liberals. It's like my mom writes paper. They're not very. They're, I, the sound, I do. I sound mean by saying they're not a lot of fun. I just. I just feel like they're kind of DC liberals are just kind of. They're very careful and accurate yeah. and safe and yeah. My mom writes right. like she writes letters to, you know, the Washington Post about racism and inclusion, and then they get printed in the Washington Post. And her other liberal friends read her letter about inclusion. Her other white liberal friends and they put it up on their refrigerators. Right. And that's exactly. kind of how it works. It's like mom. it's like an, an echo chamber. They're just doing it for themselves, for their yeah. like little group of friends. You mentioned uh, doing Sam shows on the road. 
uh, a few minutes ago. You're doing stand up now, correct? You're you're going yeah. out on doing shows. W when's your next show? You have something coming up. Um, I have something tonight, but my next like bigger show, headlining show, is in Austin on May 14th. I'm playing at the Paramount Theater there. I always wondered about that when when on Fallon or Colbert or whatever when they uh, have a comedian on and they say they're playing whatever venue in Minneapolis or Austin mm -hmm. or wherever. It's funny because like, am I supposed to fly to Austin? Am I supposed to, it's funny to like announce that for like, well, a because, show. because what we think, what we think is whoever happens to be there, if we can sell some more tickets that weekend, we may as well use the plug of Fallon or whatever. But I also feel like it's a sadness because it really shows you what our actual lives are. Because <laughs> you can turn on the TV and be like, Oh my God, she's on the tonight show. And then at the end you'll be like, you know, I'll be at like the scan cut in Des Moines. And you're like, Oh, like <laughs> it tells you what her act. It is a bit of truth at the end. You're like, she's still trying to sell tickets to this skank chuckle hut um, <laughs> in Toledo. It's not good. And it's not because you'll oh, do by, that. By the way, and, you by, know, by the way my, my mom said to tell you that she saw you on, she remembers seeing you on Fallon and that you're very funny. She said, oh. she said to, to, tell, to tell you that. What is her name? Your mom. Her name, my mom's is Tony. Tony. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. I needed that more than you know, Tony. Thank you. Thank you for making Jordan. He's a very lovely young man. Oh, she 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 would agree with you. She would agree with you. And she also agrees with you that it's time for me to not be a single bachelor. Um, Rachel has been softly pushing me into having children. I I just ask you what your long-term plans are, but I don't think that's I even think worse. My... That's even worse than asking me if I ask me if I my my long-term plans. That's not really how I say it. What I yeah. say. What I did say to you, to be fair, was you should wait till the bottom of the ninth to have a kid, <laughs> but you would be a good dad. I appreciate it. I appreciate you thinking because I would be a good dad. A, because Frankie was, my daughter was really smiling at you a lot. Yeah. I'm not like, but listen, Tony, if, if, if we're, if you're listening, my story is different, which is I'm going to make sure that Jordan knocks somebody up sh shortly, a willing participant, but I'm going to make, I'll see if he can impregnate. What would your mom want? Like a nice, are you Catholic? What are you? We're Methodist, but she's open-minded. Okay. She even told me at one point, she says, I don't care if you're gay, just find a partner and adopt some children. That's I'm going to just find him the nicest atheist Jew partner <laughs> named Art that he could ever find. I'll, I will sniff the lands for the finest Jew. That was one of the weirdest sentences. <laughs> that, that, is, that is a really strange. I will use thought. my. Jewish snout and sniff the lands for the best Jewish boy for Jordan. And that is my promise to you, Tony. Jordan. Well, I, I will say, I will say, Rachel, um, here's Wait, what I can say. Did I just get her name wrong? What was her name again? Tony. You got it right. Tony. Wow. That's such a cool name. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I will say I'm not really, the idea of knocking someone off up shortly isn't super appealing, but I will say, here's what I will say is I will make it my mission to to settle down and be a father soon enough so that Frankie can babysit that kid. Oh, that's really beautiful. Thank you for that. I feel like, I feel like I already got good vibes from Frankie. That she, she would be a good babysitter, a responsible she really did, person. Like, she was very fond of you, you know, but look, I'm not settled down. I'm still like on the road, hurling my dumb. Body. I didn't mean to accuse you of being settled down. No, but I just want for the record, the people out there specifically, Tony to know mm -hmm. Um, I am a real wayward, uh, I was going to say whore, but that's not appropriate. I'm not a whore, but just, I mean like a whore in the fun loving sense, like yeah. whoring about not sexual, you know? Yeah. Not, you're not a good time gal. No, a, I'm just like a road lady. Yeah. I mean like I'm, a road lady. Uh, yeah. I feel like I'm a road woman. Just this woman always with like a, a road warrior, <laughs> you know, do you, I, I'll, I'll joke aside. Do you enjoy being on the road? Do you enjoy doing comedy tours? I love stand up. A little bit, not a lot. Like, like for example, like Austin. I love going to Austin. That's going to be so fun. You know, playing at the Paramount Theater there is like, that'll be the best in May. It's beautiful there. And um, so comp pl places- Is it being filmed? Is it being filmed for anything? Do you know? No, I'll probably film it myself just because I'm like, I try to film my sets lately just to, you know, look at- to Because I'm working on a new hour. You, but hate, you hate looking at yourself though. I know that you don't like watching yourself. <laughs> Hard. Yeah, it's disgusting. I mean, just then when you played that clip, you didn't tell me that was going to happen. I was just like, why? why Should I have given you a heads up that I was playing a clip that you appeared in? I looked so <laughs> foul in that clip. And I was like, I should have just, 
not worn sneakers. Like my calves look so much better when I don't sneaker them. I was, I was real disgusted by myself. Yeah. yeah. It's not good. It's not easy watching yourself. And then well, every I, time on Twitter, some guy named Mr. Twat Waffles calls me fat whenever I do anything. So I have to like, and then I, everybody says, don't read this shit. But of course I read all of it. I was like, re I'll be deep in a comment section. And some guy named Mr. Twat Waffles calls me fat. And then this other guy, like Muff Eater 6969 sticks up for me. And I feel like people make friendships over their either joint hatred of me or they agree to leave me alone, you know, but people probably take vacations that meet. And you'll, but you'll ignore the, the 70 other comments that say how funny the joke exactly. is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wait for when Twat Waffles calls me fat because that's the one I believe. You know, I got a piece of it. I got a piece of it. other 70 people. Why do you think I'm doing this? Because I believe the one guy with his arms crossed, who's just like, ugh. Yeah. Know, that's the one I believe. Like Statler and Waldorf on the Muppets sitting there in the balcony, you know. Exactly. Oh my yeah. God. One comment. That just got me so excited and I looked. Oh at yeah. It. it just says my mom does the same. Thank you so much. I see you. That's what my mom said she's gonna do to people of color now to let them know she supports them um in this racist world we live in. She goes, I'm just gonna say, I see you, I honor you. Can you imagine? That's terrifying. Yeah. I celebrate you. And she's gonna acknowledge the legacy of racism behind her name. Some woman is trying to like get a coffee at Starbucks and my mom's gonna be like, I see you, I honor you. She's gonna come smocking up in a Cherokee shawl. And as long as she doesn't as long as she doesn't mention if she, if she if she wants people who would 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 mention uh their ancestors to someone, that would be like the worst like like move for your mom to make is be like, I wanna honor your ancestors. Oof. Yeah, that's a rough one. I don't know. I mean, Karen, her heart's in the right place, but I don't know when she goes, speaking of going rogue, I don't know what she's saying to people. Mm -hmm. I don't know. She's trying, her heart is in the right place though. Karen Feinstein is on the right side of things, but she, I don't know what she's saying to people. It's probably not good. Before we let you go, Rachel, we have to talk, uh, I want to talk about the uh, FX documentary in Hysterical which came out, I guess, uh, a week or so ago, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so explain what that documentary is for someone who hasn't seen it. So it's a documentary about um, uh, women in stand-up, our, our friendships, uh, the kind of the history of uh, women in, in comedy, uh, what it's like for us on the road versus the guys, what it's been like, how it is now, and our kind of just like, our lives, what the actual day to day is. It's some of what I've talked about here. My friend Jessica Carson uh, is producing it and she's hysterical. We um, are coming out with a prank album actually that we've been working on now to called uh, Call Girls. And we kind of, it's kind of like the, you know, female jerky boys. Um, Crank yankers. Yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, exactly. It got us through COVID. Just, I was pregnant during COVID, you know, married to fireman. She lost her dad. So we were having these really strange the extra terrifying, bizarre years, but then we would just call and, and, and call local businesses and um, say dumb things. And we found it very, very uh, healing. And therapeutic. <laughs> and therapeutic, bit, yes. I love prank. It's the kind of shit I would do as a kid, prank calling, and I'd have so much fun doing it. So it was kind of fun to come back and do that um, during quarantine where I miss stand up so much just to do something so silly and simple like that. Um, we're going to, We'll be doing like more press for it and uh, going on the view and stuff to promote it. So hopefully people buy it. But um, but yeah, so that's been really fun. Jessica produced it. She also, if you want to look it up, anybody, there is um, it's on Hulu and uh, streaming on Hulu now. And she did another interview for the view, just talking about it and kind of why we did it and why she did it, it was her idea. Um, but it's really cool. Like watching it, it's kind of like going through down memory lane just thinking about like it's all these comics that I know and love and are really funny and my closest friends talking about how they started and what it's like and the green rooms and the weird bullshit and how they'll just send like any sex offender to get you from the airport mm -hmm. so it's kind of like the bad and the good but it's also a lot of hilarious stand-up in it so it's like you sold me I haven't watched it yet and uh it's a, I think it's really it's it needed to be told by somebody that does it I so tell you who's gonna really play. like this Rachel is Tony Tony will watch this oh my god Tony please yeah because she has Hulu and so and Tony I regret calling myself a whore and um that's not a nice thing to say about yourself even if you mean it ironically 
Um, and I'm going to find a nice uh, lady for Jordan, mm -hmm. man or a uh, lady or fella, whatever, whatever they identify as. I don't care as long as they're going to make uh, good grandchildren for you. She'll appreciate that. She'll appreciate that. I like Tony. All right, Rachel, I will uh, talk to you probably in three hours. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but thanks for thanks for doing the show. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, yeah. By the way, Jordan directed this thing that I'm in called Wine Ant. So everybody look out for Wine Ant because that's, look out how, for we, Wine Ant. that's and how we met. And that's I'm how we met. Jordan. And I'll, I'll give a teaser for Wine Ant, just a little like visual. This is the, uh, the official Wine Ant championship belt right here. I, I, Oh, that's so funny. I have it. Yes. It's in <laughs> safekeeping. I'm saving it for this when the Smithsonian wants it. You know, I've got to keep it, of keep course. it safe. <laughs> that's so funny that you have it. What yeah. You yeah. Well, I, I grabbed it. I grabbed it. It's only going to, that's right. Exactly. It's right. This sucker is going to be on um, like Antiques Roadshow or Pawn Stars or something at some point. Yeah. That makes me so happy. I feel like it's safe with you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. Okay. I'll talk to you. In a we'll talk while. to you later. All right. Bye-bye. That was Rachel Feinstein. You can go and follow her on Instagram at Rachel Feinstein underscore. And that's it for me on It's Real with Jordan Demi. You can go to uh, popdust.com for an archive of all our past shows. You can follow me on Instagram at Jordan Edwards Studio. And uh, we will see you next week. Thanks for listening.